Hi, my name is Joseph Lumpkin. Hello from Alabama, where the men are handsome, the women are beautiful, and our kids can shoot a dime at 300 yards. So, I'm here to talk to you today about the DDK. The DDK is uh, also called the uh, Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. Probably written around 50 to 80 CE, which puts it at a possible, uh, possibly even written before the Gospels because they were all written in that period of time. Some people string out uh, Acts or uh, even the Gospel or the uh, Apocalypse of John, Revelation, in other words, uh, to uh, 100, 120 AD. So this thing could have come before all or many of the Gospels. It's supposed to have been written by the uh, Apostles. Chances are it was not. Uh, but it, it is a catechism, and it does describe how uh, and by what path uh, Gentiles and pagans could come into the faith, be converted, and uh, live and share in the Christian life. So it teaches what to believe. And so the thing that's fascinating about this book is what it doesn't teach. Uh, it does not teach that uh, there is a trinity. Uh, now, it does have a formula for baptism that is to dunk three times Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But nowhere in there does it come up and say that Jesus is co-equal uh, to God. Uh, there is evidence that uh, specifically links this to the Nazarene synagogue. And the Nazarenes were the Jews that converted uh, or a sect that, that followed Jesus. Uh, the, they're Hellenized Jews. They usually sit around the uh, Syrian border. They were close to Antioch. And, um, and so we know that that church was heavily influenced by uh, the DDK. We believe that Paul was the uh, leader of that particular uh, band. And uh, we know that the uh, DDK is an evolved document. That is to say, it has been changed and added on uh, through time. So keeping in mind that there were differences between how James believed Christianity should work and how Paul believed Christianity should work, we have to keep in mind this is a Pauline structure where uh, the, the very first uh, Christians were Jews. They were uh, a, a sect, a cult called the Jesus Cult which is a splinter group of, uh, of Judaism at that particular time. So there were the Essenes, uh, the uh, uh, Pharisee, the Sadducees, and, and then the, the Jesus cult that seems to fit in more with the Essene teachings because we think that John the Baptist was probably from the Essene community. And Jesus was, of course, baptized into uh, that movement uh, by John and um, so uh, there you go. The book was discovered in 1873. Um, it was discovered by the Metropolitan of Nicomedia. Uh, a Metropolitan is like a bishop over a particular territory. The discovery contained um, a small 11th century codex of about 120 pages. That text was in turn published in 1883. We've known about the text for quite some time because it's been called out in other people's writing, uh, such as John of uh, Damascus around 250 to 380 CE, uh, and he, he calls out this book and makes reference to it. This particular book is uh, used as a foundational text for uh, something called the Didascalia, which is actually part of the Ethiopic Orthodox Church canon uh, because it, it is basically how to uh, run a church and what to believe. So here are the things that we think that we know about placing the Didasche in history. It was written while the churches were still being led by traveling preachers and prophets. There was no stable pastor on a church. Um, the baptisms were normally performed still in river or stream because baptisms traditionally were in what's called living water, that is to say pure moving water. The Eucharist or commun communion was still celebrated in conjunction with the agape or the love feast. 
and uh, there's an absence of uh, theological dogma and discussion, especially regarding such things as the Trinity. The take on the resurrection of Jesus was not that he was divine, but that uh, the resurrection was God's stamp of approval, showing that he was a true Messiah and that the people should listen to his teachings and follow his teachings. So there was no divinity connected to it. It was God saying, uh, give a stamp of approval. This is my proof that he is my Messiah. Of course, you have to keep in mind what Messiah means, which is the uh, chosen or anointed one. And it's a person that actually was usually anointed uh, for a particular purpose. And so there you go. It wasn't until uh, the second century CE that the concept of the virgin birth of Jesus took hold. Keeping in mind that James, the brother of Jesus, was still running the church in uh, Jerusalem for quite some time, and it's very difficult to tell a brother uh, that his mother was a virgin. It just doesn't make any sense to, uh, to, to the ears or brain if you put yourself in their position. Uh, Jesus had worked with James, was given the reins to the major church uh, or synagogue in Jerusalem to continue to teach what Jesus was teaching, which was uh, that the end was coming, the kingdom of God was at hand, and that we should get our act together. It was an apocalyptic message to the Jews to get them to straighten up and fly right. It is interesting to see from this angle how, as the cliche says, the religion that Jesus practiced slowly became the religion of Jesus or about Jesus. And I believe that Jesus, if he looked at Christianity today, would not recognize his message or what he had planned because he never wanted to start another religion. He was just trying to get his right. It's an interesting point of view that the doxology that occurs on the Lord's Prayer on a lot of the uh, uh, Protestant churches, uh, based on the Textus Receptus, which is where the King James came from, has the, uh, the the doxology of for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen attached to the uh, lord's prayer in the oldest uh references the oldest witnesses uh, that doxology disappears it wasn't there knowing that the texas receptus was drawn from uh, uh codices that were like in the 12th century 12th and 13th century uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, over, over a thousand years uh, to, to add things to it. Well, it turns out that uh, we don't have to look too far because it looks like the, uh, the appending um, doxology uh, began possibly with the DDK. Uh, it was in good form at that particular time to say the Lord's Prayer and then append your, uh, your request or your, your blessing uh, to the end of the Lord's Prayer. In other words, make it personal. So in this particular case, uh, someone had written a form of the doxology and put it in the uh, Didache. Their idea of making the prayer personal, and it was so beautiful and powerful that it got incorporated into some of the codices of the, uh, of the Gospels. And so there you have it, uh, pops up uh, in the Protestant churches. So another thing that kind of blows out of the water is this idea of sola uh, scriptura, um, you know, that the Bible has everything in it that we need to be saved and that it takes the Bible to be saved. In other words, scripture alone is what that means. Well, uh, that can't possibly be. I mean, it just destroys that because you here you have no New Testament. You have no Bible. You have no scriptura for there to be sola about uh, and yet we still have a formula for what you should believe and how you should be baptized in order to be saved. So the idea that you need the Bible to be saved is actually blown out of the water by what the uh, Didaske has to say about what the Gentiles need to do, how they need to believe, and what they need to do to be baptized. So all of this is going on long before anything was supposedly canon. One more thing that I'll mention before I close, because we're going close to 10 minutes now, is that uh, there's a strong Jewish emphasis on leadership and prophecy, baptism and liturgy around, uh, and, and also around the Eucharist for that. 
So the idea of the uh, rapture did not occur until much, much later. Usually we place the uh, first beginnings of the theology of the rapture at the last part of the 1700s or the first part of the 1800s. So in the eyes of those reading the Didache, what we're looking for here is not the rapture, but the return of Jesus, the imminent return of Jesus that would uh, uh, signal that the end of days was upon us and had happened and that we we're going to get the, uh, the reign of God on earth. So that's about it. Uh, get rid of your trinity, get rid of the idea of the virgin birth, get rid of the idea of the rapture, and, uh, and you've got pretty much what the DDK is uh, explaining to the new converts. All right, until next time, thank you.